So, you want to be like Mike. Well, stay tuned. Hello again, everyone. I'm Eli's dad with Project Eli, where we educate, lead, and inspire. And you, I'm sure you've heard of the commercial, to Be Like Mike. Uh, as a basketball player, but you know what? You take a look at what he's done business-wise, the man's a billionaire, so he's learned a few lessons. A lot of those lessons came from his relationship with basketball, and I've gone over, uh, in my mind, some of the things that I've learned from basketball, and I want to share them with you because basketball is just like life, and here's how it is. First thing I want to talk about is running. If you're not able to run in a basketball game, what good are you? All right? I mean, the game is up and down. It's running, 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 running. I remember when I first got to college and I went to go play in a pickup game uh, before the season even started. And, you know, nobody knew who I was. Here's this skinny kid, 6'1", 175. Boy, can I remember 175? I'm a, I'm a biscuit or two over that right now. My point is that when I played in these pickup games, I remember there was this one particular guy, I'm going to call him Fred, frankly I don't remember his name, and this guy was about 6'4 or 6'5, which is really good size for a basketball player, and pretty well built, but the guy couldn't run. But what he could do is he could shoot the lights out. My goodness, when we played in these pickup games, he was virtually always the number one pick because he could take the ball in from 20, 25 feet, boom, swish, 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 swish. And so I'm thinking to myself, boy, I bet this, you know, this guy's a pretty good player. Why doesn't he go out for the team? He doesn't go out for the team because he can't run. And if you can't run, even if you're the best shooter in the entire, on the entire planet, you're not going to be a good player. So in life, if you're not able to run, if your health is not good, if you're not with the proper mindset, if you don't have enough want to, you're not going to make it. So you've got to be able to run. Next thing I want to talk about is pacing. You know, I remember from when I was first starting to coach out in the Bay Area, we played a couple of teams. I want to tell you about these two teams, the pacing, the story about pacing completely different. One of the teams was from a, a, a town called Saratoga, which I do believe is the where Apple has its headquarters. I'm not sure, but I think that's where Apple has their headquarters. Anyway, we're playing, going to play Saratoga, and I was sent to go scout Saratoga. Well, when I went to see Saratoga, because we already knew they were a good team because we'd seen their record, these guys just ran and ran and ran and ran and ran, and they never slowed down. Everything was running, 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 running. They were in unbelievably great shape. And so when we were preparing to play them, that's how we practiced. And unfortunately for us, they cleaned our clocks. They were just, you know, <laughs> we're, out of, we're out of breath. And these guys are still going because that's the way they played. Their pacing was so fast. They had it under control. They controlled the action with their fast break pacing. On the other hand, we had a big game with a team that we were trying to qualify for the tournament uh, in, in uh, high school in Palo Alto, I believe they're gun high, and they had a player named Kent, who for us could have been Clark Kent. He went on to play uh, Division One basketball. He was clearly the best player in the league, very talented. And so our strategy was, let's see how often we can keep the ball out of Kent's hands. So we practice our pacing to slow the game down, to make, keep our, make our possessions as long as possible and make sure that we got good shots. And we started to do that, and what happened with the other team, and Kent, I mean, just a high school guy, but tremendous player, they start to get frustrated. You know, the pacing wasn't what they wanted. They, you know, when they got the ball, they couldn't wait to go, and they rushed, they hurried. And we blew their doors off. They were, for my money, much better team as far as talent is concerned, but because we controlled the pacing of the game, we slowed it down, they were got frustrated and we were terrific that particular game. Our shooting was on target and everything. It was fabulous. 
but pacing is key. So whether you're going very, very fast or you're going very, very slow, keep in mind that pacing in life is very, very important. And we've seen that right now with this pandemic as an example. Right now, as I'm talking to you, you know, after Thanksgiving and between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we're seeing coronavirus cases spiraling out of the universe. On the one hand, on the other hand, we have the vaccine just about ready to rock and roll, get out there big time. So keep your pace, keep an eye on your pacing. Don't be throwing away your masks just yet. We only have a couple more months where we have to, you know, be in hibernation in order to stay healthy. So keep track of your pacing. It's true in basketball, it's true in life. Which brings me to my next one, which is outlasting or persistence. We have, in basketball, you have to have the persistence to keep going. As an example, one of the things that we would do is we would, you know, press full court right from the beginning of the game. That was what I did with my team. We press right from the beginning of the game. And in the beginning, when the other team is, you know, they're fresh, they're coming out, you know, they're, they were, most of the time they could handle the press pretty well. But as the game went along, because what pressing does is it speeds up the game, what would happen is the players on the other team would start to get a little bit fatigued. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as Vince Lombardi famously said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. So if you have the ability to outlast your opponents, to uh, and your opponent can be a person, the opponent can be a circumstance, it can be, you know, there's any number of things, scenarios change. You know, if you have the persistence to outlast and keep going, that is going to be a big feather in your cap as far as achieving the success that you desire and you deserve. The next one in basketball I want to talk about is positioning. My goodness, it is so critical in a basketball game to be in the right position. You have to be in the right position to receive the ball. When you receive the ball, you want to be in what we call the triple threat position. What's a triple threat position? That means you can dribble, pass, or shoot. So you want to receive the ball with your legs bent, all right, because if you receive it standing up, your first move is always to bend down. Why? That's wasted movement. So make sure you have the right positioning. Additionally to that, think about when you have a superior big man, like one that comes to mind, of course, is Shaquille O'Neal. 7'1", 270, 280, the guy took up a lot of space. And the other teams knew that. So what would they do? They would try and position themselves to deny Shaq the ball. But Shaq was clever, so he knew how to position his body, he knew how to, how to block somebody from being in front of him so that he could receive the ball. And once he received the ball down near the basket, game over. All right? I mean, that's why the man's in the Hall of Fame, because he couldn't be stopped. But the key to his success was his positioning. The same thing is true in life. Are you in position to be a success? If all you're doing is complaining, whining, whizzing, and moaning, and you're not doing anything to put yourself in the position for when that opportunity, when the ball is thrown to you to score, you're not ready. So positioning is a key element. Rebounding. Oh, okay, rebounding. One of the things that we work on in, in, when we're coaching basketball as, as basketball players, you put something on the rim so that the ball can never go in. We used to put a, a, a ring, they make a special thing, you put it on the, on the rim so if somebody shoots, even if it's going to go in, it bounces out because you got this metal thing blocking it. And so that was the way we would teach our guys to make sure that they blocked out. The best thing that can happen as a, as a coach when, you, when you're coaching rebounding is for the ball to actually hit the floor where you have somebody blocked out and they can't get it and the only place that the ball will come is to hit the floor, so you're in position to get it because you're in front of that guy. So be in position. Additionally, rebounding means recovering a miss. So that's a critical thing in basketball because that gives you another chance. And also the fact that 
when you're there and you're rebounding and you're close to the basket and somebody just misses and you're in a position to just tip the ball and put it back in the basket, that's easy. All right, how does this relate to life? Well, first of all, you've got to block out all of the distracting elements, all the elements that are not positive for you and give yourself that work time, that super work time and block out everything else and have that singleness of purpose. Recovering a miss? My goodness, you have to be able to pick yourself up. Guess what folks, just like in basketball, not every shot's going to go in the basket. You have to be able to recover from that miss and continue to play the game, whether the game is basketball or the game is life. And of course, there's the tip-ins that we talked about where many times when you're blocking out and you're in position, you just miss. Well, be in a position to rebound, to just tip it back in because you're that close and you need to take advantage of the proximity you are to the goal, to the basket. The same thing is true in life. You're very close, make sure you take advantage of your proximity to the finish line, the goal that you're trying to achieve. Of course, the most treasured skill in basketball is scoring. So once you are in position to score, you gotta score. That's the name of the game. When you're playing offense, if there's nobody in front of you, don't run the play, go to the basket, lay it in. If you're a defender and you're, you're covering your guy and someone's coming to the basket unimpeded, get in front of them, play defense, because the name of the game is scoring to put the ball in the basket. And and doesn't matter if your guy, if you go, well, I got my guy covered, doesn't matter, that's a team game. If somebody else scores, it still counts against you, doesn't it? You want to make sure that you have the skill and the ability to see the opportunity so that when the opportunity comes to score, you're in a position to score. Now that might mean shooting with your left hand, Eli, being in a because you have the left side taking advantage of that. In life, the same thing is true. You're not always going to be able to go to your biggest strength. One of the things you want to be able to do is to go where the opportunity leads you to score. Timing. Oh, timing is everything. If you're a fraction of a second late in basketball, the other team's going to tip the ball, the other team's going to intercept the ball. Timing is everything. So what's the key to timing? Anticipation. You have to be able to anticipate where the ball is moving, where the players are moving. You want to keep, in basketball, what we want, we always say, have man-ball contact. You want to be looking, you know, it looks like you're not looking at either the man or the ball, but on one eye you're looking at your guy, and, and on the other hand, you're looking at where the ball is, and you want to be in between. Why? Because that allows you to anticipate. So you need to keep your eye on the ball as well as your individual assignment. What does that mean as far as timing is concerned? You have to be able to look at the big picture as well as your particular assignment and how it fits in. As you acquire mastery, preparation becomes more critical. What do, how does that relate to basketball? All right. Well, I played high school basketball. I was somewhat of a, of a big shot in high school. Not a great big shot, but somewhat. Anyway, then I went to college and I'm playing in college. You know what? There's a big difference between playing in high school and playing in college. When you're playing in college, a lot of times you're there and you have a scholarship. And so the fact that you're playing basketball is one of the reasons why they're helping to pay for your education. As a result, they want to make sure that you're in a position to deliver the goods. So if you're going to deliver the goods, one of the things you have to do is to be able to play. All right, so what kind of preparation am I talking about? Well, I could be talking about scouting. Okay, that's one thing. But in this particular case, I'm talking about shaving your ankles. Why would you ever want to shave your ankles? All right, well, when you're playing basketball, and keep in mind, it's not just the games. You've got practices. You play two games a week when you're in college, but you have practice four or five of the other days uh, just as well. I mean, we were practicing six, six days a week. 
uh, when I was playing college ball. And so when you're playing in practice, you're still cutting, you're still moving, you're still going full speed. And basketball is a game where one of the things where you're most vulnerable is spraining your ankle. So one of the rules when you get to college is you have to tape your ankles. You have to give yourself that little added protection. The why and because on that is when you have that little added protection, it eliminates to a small degree the, the frequency of the times that you're going to hurt your ankle. So, and why do you have to shave your ankles? Did you ever try and rip some tape off your ankle when you have hair on it? Ow! All right, think of what it's like when you rip off a band-aid on some place where you have hair. Well, think about every single day ripping off some tape from your feet and, you, and then you've, it, it's just awful, it's just painful. So you shave your ankles so that you can get taped and so it won't be painful. Does that make sense? All right, and by the way, one of the things when I used to take off my socks and when I was in the dorms or uh, people would look at my ankles and they go, what's the steroid with your ankles? You don't have any hair on your ankles, okay? Well, you do what you gotta do in order to get the job done. Don't let pride get in the way of your pocketbook. Okay, I've spoken about this before, and I want to give you a specific example. When I was in high school, uh, actually when I was in grammar school, I had uh, kind of a workout partner, his name was Bruce Rosen, and Bruce was a fine basketball player. And then we went to high school, and we played freshman ball together, and he and I started on the freshman team. We weren't the best players, but we started on the team, and so on. And then, sophomore and junior year, Bruce started to hang around with other people that weren't athletes. All right, and you, you know, I'm tying this in with, you know, you become the five people you hang around with the most. And these were, keep in mind, this is like, you know, the, the, the early, the late 60s, early 70s, you know, these are very turbulent times, politically speaking. And Bruce was a great basketball player, and then he, he was hanging around with these guys, and they had long hair, and were doing other things, and so on and so forth. And one of the rules uh, that the basketball coach had was, if you're going to come and play ball, you have to have a basketball player's haircut. Keep in mind, times have changed. But back then, that was a big deal. So the question came down to, is Bruce going to cut his hair to play ball or not? Well, his sophomore and junior year, he decided, no, I'm not going to cut my hair, and he didn't go out for the team. He came out for the team as a senior. He cut his hair, came out for the team as a senior, but he lost those two years of high school competition. And Bruce was okay as a senior, but, I mean, he and I were somewhat equal when we were freshmen in terms of players, as, as playing ability. But when we got to be seniors, I was up here and he was down here. And those two years that he didn't play organized basketball just absolutely killed his progress. He let pride get in the way of your pocketbook. You have to decide, is something important enough for me to take a stand? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. This was, to be very candid with you, a sometimes it isn't. He should have cut his hair and he should have played ball, and I'm sure if we could speak to Bruce today, he would say, boy, I sure regret not playing ball when I was a sophomore or junior, because these are memories that you carry with you for a lifetime. So you don't want to let pride get in the way of your pocketbook. Sometimes you have to do things that aren't copacetic with your character. And I'm not saying, you know, have a bad character. What I'm saying is make a good judgment. Next thing I want to talk about is angles. Basketball is a game of angles. You have to make sure that when you're passing somebody the ball, it's coming into them from the right angle. So you look, you try and get the ball into, let's say, your Shaquille O'Neal, you know, down near the basket, and you're at the, you're at the top, and you're looking, and there's a guy in front. Okay, well, you can't get the ball there because there's a guy blocking it. So you pass the ball to the side, and Shaquille O'Neal now blocks the guy out from going because he's in front of him, and now the angle has changed. You're able to make that pass. How does that relate to life? 
you will come across all sorts of different obstacles in your life, be it people, be it circumstances, whatever. You have got to be willing to change the angle on your thinking. You've got to be able to change the angle on your thinking. Change the paradigm. Look at things from a different perspective. Basketball is clearly a game of angles. Success in life is a game of paradigms changing the angle and getting into the most advantageous position to move the ball into position to score. And the last one I want to talk about today is pressing and fast breaking. We touched on that before, you know, pressing is when you go and cover somebody, not at half court, but full court, all the way. So you're denying, you're saying, I'm going to make it difficult for you to dribble right from the get-go. I'm going to make it difficult for you to receive the pass right from the get-go. I'm going to be blocking. What most people do, what most teams do, and, and you see this in the pros, is they don't really start to play defense, for the most part, heavy defense, until around half court. All right, they let the people bring the ball up. Why? Because it takes a lot of energy to do that. All right, and fast breaking the same thing. You get the ball off the basket, boom, you want to go, you want to run like nobody's business towards the other end. And in the beginning of the game, what happens is it, it you know, pe people have energy, you know, and stamina at that point in the game. But as the game goes on, cumulatively speaking, you start to wear the other team down. And if you're losing in the game and you need to speed things up and you need to turn the ball over, you need to get more possessions, you can't score unless you have possession of the ball, you have to be aware of the timeline, of the clock, of what the clock is telling you. I only have four minutes, I have to make up five points, I better hurry because if I don't, the other team's going to take their time. We need to turn the ball over. So. Pressing and fast breaking are things that work not only initially to some degree, but more further on down the road at the end of the game, it, they, it become, you have a cumulative effect and you're aware of the timeline that you have to achieve your particular desired outcome. Isn't that true in life? Hey, the pandemic, people may, company, all these different companies researching and developing vaccines. They're aware of the timeline. The timeline is the longer we wait, the more people are going to get infected and the more people we're going to lose to this virus. And the key thing is that they were focused on getting the job done. Getting this, these vaccines right now is, is nothing short of a miracle because of the focus that was put upon this particular objective. And so there was fast breaking and there was pressing certainly involved in developing this virus and uh, in developing this, va this vaccine for the virus. So the point is in life, you're going to come across certain timelines and remember that the things that you do on a day by day basis are cumulative and they add up. And then once you get to that point where you've reached, you know, the, the edge of the cliff, Boom, it's like falling off a cliff. All of the right things will start to happen because of the cumulative positiveness of the things that you did previously. That was a mouthful. All right. Well, I've given you today 11 things how basketball imitates life. If you want to be like Mike, these are lessons I'm sure Michael Jordan learned. And there's a lot more. We're doing a whole series on this. Eli, I want to speak to you in your language, the language of basketball. But you do not have to be a basketball aficionado to understand these things and see the congruencies therein. And because we'll never end a meeting on a philosophical note, let's get out there, take the ball, and charge! I'm Eli's dad.